Thank you so much for your warm welcome. Thank you, Pastor Thomas, for allowing me to share about my ministry this morning. Um, I wonder if I can have the slides. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the organization Agape. You may have heard, some of you may have heard of Campus Crusade for Christ, which is the name with which it was founded. Um, sorry, next slide. It was founded in 1951 in California by a man named Bill Bright. When Mr. Bright was studying at university, he felt the Lord calling him to start a Christian union movement, which gradually grew to other universities in America and also to other countries. And it became an organization and the focus of the organization also, also grew to other areas of society and not only uh, in university campuses. So in Spain, Agape was founded uh, 55 years ago. We currently have 96 missionaries working full time in eight cities and we have nine uh, ministries or projects being run right now. These logos on the right are the logos of the projects that we are running. Um, so I'd like to share with you a bit about um, each of these projects. I won't um, take too long, I promise. Um, the mission of Agape is to share the gospel of Jesus in different areas of society by tending to the needs of the people of those areas in society. The Agape headquarters are in Valencia now. Even though Agape was funded in Barcelona originally, the current director is from Valencia, so um, the headquarters are in Valencia. And the director and his wife are very good friends of ours as well. Um, in the UK, there is also Agape. The, the um, headquarters are in Birmingham. Although I've never visited them, I have spoken to the team on several occasions. So, to start our um, projects, Agape Plus is a team that works with homeless people, asylum seekers, and victims of sexual trafficking. We have two reception flats in Barcelona, one for men, one for women, in which we can lodge up to six people for a year. And during that year, we help them get their legal papers sorted, get a job, and integrate into society. Um, the team also go out once a week with food, blankets, clothes, um, and hand them out to as many people as they can find out on the streets. Uh, next slide. Prayerton 24-7. Oh, sorry, I meant, to, I meant to mention some of these uh, projects are specific to Spain, but there are also some that are international. This is one of our international projects. Prayer 24-7. Um, the team basically promotes prayer in churches and Christian organizations. Um, they have created an app for phones, which is very similar to the Bible app that we all have on our phones. You wouldn't think that it would be necessary to promote prayer in churches, would you? But it is actually, sorry, nowadays very necessary. Next slide. From family to family, um, they do uh, family and marriage counselling. My husband and I actually did a marriage orientation seminar with them before we got married, which was really good. Next slide. Agape Campus actually began in Valencia and then spread to other cities of Spain. It is where my husband and I met when we were studying our uh, university degrees and we helped out running uh, Bible studies and other activities. At one point we ran free guitar lessons at the university, which was quite fun. Next slide. GAIN is our international humanitarian aid project. We have a huge uh, warehouse near Valencia where we store um, blankets, food, uh, clothes and uh, essential hygiene products which we send out to areas where there has been a war or a natural disaster. Several churches of Valencia are involved in this project. So basically when we run a fundraising campaign, the churches collect food and clothes and blankets, but mostly um, hygiene products which are very necessary and we store them in the warehouse and when we're ready to send them out because there's enough we load them onto lorries and we send them to wherever is needed at the time. Gain is also part of a project called Water for Life with which we um, build clean water wells in different areas of Africa where there is no access to clean water. We have two children's schools in Haiti and we send volunteers every year to help out in a refugee camp, camp in Lesbos. Next slide. 
Shine work with teenagers. Those of you who have teenagers, not my case yet, know that this is a difficult and trying age and the Shine team run workshops on bullying and other issues in different schools in the south of Spain. Next slide. Who has heard of the St. James's Way? Or who knows of it? Or who's walked it? Anyone? No? Okay, so the St. James's Way is the name given to a set of pilgrimage routes. It, is, um, it has a medieval Catholic origin, and all the routes lead to the, where they believe is the tomb of St. James the Greater, located in the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in the north of Spain. Every year, between the months of April and October, hundreds of pilgrims walk the way, and um, at kilometre 75 of the French Way, what is called the French Way, Agape has a hostel that is run by this couple here, and the difference between this hostel and the many, many hostels that are along the way is that it is run by Christians, and everything is completely free. So pilgrims can use the facilities, they can spend the night, they can eat lunch, breakfast, supper. And every night uh, we project the film of Jesus on a big screen in one of the rooms. And this leads to very interesting conversations with the pilgrims and even some of them giving their life to the Lord. Next slide, please. Athlete in, Athletes in Action, sorry, is also an international ministry. Um, we have a gym, a very big gym in the city of Barcelona uh, that is called the Total Fit Box. So anyone who signs up to this gym knows that it is run by a Christian couple from Agape and they pray before they train, they do retreats, they do Bible studies, tending to the physical and spiritual needs of the athletes that belong to the gym. Next slide please. Anything for a Smile is one of my favourite ministries and you'll soon understand why. Um, the team visits sick children and premature babies in hospitals, several hospitals in the south of Spain. They dress up as clowns, they take puppets, they do storytelling, they do arts and crafts. Some children are hospitalised for months, even years, and they spend time with the children and their families. Having had two premature babies myself, And going back and forth to the hospital for seven weeks when one of them was born. Our daughter Sarah was born at 30 weeks and she was hospitalized for seven years. So, sorry, seven years, <laughs> seven weeks. And so my husband and I know firsthand how important it is to have a good support team because it can be a hard time. Um, some of the babies and the children, as was our case as well with our firstborn, pass away, so the team spend time with the families when they lose a child, they pray with them, they share the gospel of hope with them. Some families don't want anything to do with God um, in their time of grief, but most of the time they are very appreciative and they, they realize that Jesus is just what they need in the midst of what is happening to them. Uh, next slide please. Last but not least is the finance team. This is where I work. Like I said, the Agape headquarters is in Valencia, so we have a, a big, lovely office where I work with my team. Um, we manage all the admin, admin tasks of Agape Spain, um, from salaries to water bills, electricity bills, and donations. All of the ministries that I've mentioned before and the people that work full-time in Agape are able to do so thanks to donations. As we are a Christian organization, we receive no help from the government. And so we depend on churches, families, friends who want to be part of the mission with us and they send us donations monthly or every six months or once, once a year. And this is how we are able to serve in the ministry. My specific role is donations. So um, I process all the donations both national and international, for the whole of Agape Spain. I've been doing this now for four years, and um, I love it. It's a privilege to be able to work for an organization like this, and I feel very blessed. 
I work very closely with all the other projects in, in Agape and all the other staff and, and it's really great. Um, I'm sorry, next slide. I'm a very visual person, so I like to use pictures. If you can imagine Agape as if it was this tree here, the missions being the top of the tree, the support teams uh, being the roots of the tree, and the trunk being my team. So all different parts of a tree, but very dependent on each other. And I also like the verse in Romans 12, 4 and 5 that says, for, such, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, from, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. I have a specific role in Agape, which is different to, to my colleagues, but I also have a different role to each one of you. We are all called to um, share the gospel, be part of the Great Commission, but we each have a different role. So God calls some of us to work full-time in the ministry, dedicating all our time, our resources to doing so, and he calls others to be the ones who pray for us, encourage us, read our prayer letters, and support us financially. Last slide, thank you. So how can you be part of this great adventure with me? You can pray for me, of course, and if you would like to receive my prayer letter, please let me know. Um, but also with your financial support. Like I said, I've been working almost four years now in the ministry, and I have been able to do so thanks to a wonderful team of people who have been supporting me financially throughout these four years. But several of them cannot do so anymore, so now I'm trying to raise more, fun more funds to be able to continue in the ministry. So if you would like to be part of that financial team, please come and speak to me after church and I will explain how you can do that. Um, thank you so much and God bless you. Amen. Very, very exciting and uh, a real privilege to serve the Lord in the, these different ways and to be part, part of it. Um, the Lord said, let there be light. At the moment, I'm blind. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible to tone anything down there. But uh, um, 41 years now that uh, Leslie and myself have been in Spain. Becky was actually born in Spain. We called Rebecca Becky. Uh, and yeah, we continue to serve the Lord. We're very grateful for this assembly and the contrib contribution uh, you make monthly uh, to our family support. Um, just a brief reminder, my ministry changed a couple of years ago to uh, put down uh, pastoring and focus on the other areas of ministry, um, which are Bible teaching and uh, promoting prayer nationally in Assemblies of God and working in our uh, region, but focusing also more on uh, ministry around the churches. Uh, during some years I was the regional uh, superintendent for Assemblies of God, and um, there are a lot of churches which uh, at that time I was occasionally able to visit, but now not being the principal pastor, I'm an associate pastor with another brother, um, I'm freer to uh, accept invitations and to minister around the churches. As Becky said, you have to encourage churches to pray. Because strangely enough, a lot of churches are praying less and less. And uh, prayer is something that uh, it's like water, you know. Uh, if there's not much water, not enough water for you to swim in, yeah, you don't need to take more away, you need to add more, yeah? 
You have to keep adding it, a bit like uh, the illustration we had, until you are able to swim in the water. And prayer is like that. Folks sometimes think, what's happening with the prayer? You know, it's dead. It's uh, not much life. We have a prayer meeting, less and less people come. The answer isn't to take away the prayer you have, it's to add more. Because as prayer increases, it flows. And as it flows, it draws others in. And eventually, it becomes a river that's impossible to stop. So however much prayer you have, add more. That's a challenge for this year. Between now and next August, add more prayer, church. <laughs> Pastors. I just want to share a, a few words of encouragement this morning. And uh, really the title is, Don't Worry. Don't Worry. Uh, somebody reminded me this morning, the song that says, uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy. It's not so much the be happy I want to focus on, it's the don't worry. Because Paul actually said, don't worry about anything. You know, in the King James Version, it says, be careful for nothing. But that's what it really means in 21st century language. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. Don't worry, cover everything in fervent prayer and have peace. The peace of God will keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. We're going to read a couple of passages. Um, I'm going to read them from, I think it's the New International Version. Uh, the first is a guy who came to Jesus who we call the rich young ruler. And after he was asking about getting to heaven, Jesus answered, telling me he should keep the commandments, and then he said, well, what else? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the second passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so also we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the word of the Lord, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, one of my school teachers used to say, whenever you see a therefore, look and see what it's there for. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The rich young ruler. You know, when we hear this story, we tend to think, poor guy. What a hard test Jesus gave him. And I really hope the Lord never says that to me. Be honest. Is that what you think? Or am I the only one? Sell everything and give it to the poor. You know, I don't know very much and I don't know that anybody would give me tuppence for what I do have. But I'm attached to my stuff. It would be a wrench to let go of everything that I have. And, you know, usually when we read this story, we stop there. The poor guy who had such a hard test, and what a shame that he, he didn't come up to standard. He failed the test. And we tend to miss the most important part, which is the reason that Jesus gave him which was the reward. He said, you will have treasure in heaven. 
yet somehow that just seems such a long way off. It somehow doesn't seem quite as real, treasure in heaven, as what I've got down here. For us, somehow the reality seems to be the natural life, the here and now. The things that we can perceive with our five senses. And the spiritual and the eternal things, they seem a bit more vague. Invisible, intangible, maybe they seem less real. But we shouldn't be fooled because the opposite is true. God is the only absolute reality. Everything else is created and destroyed by a word from his mouth. And God is spirit. The reality is spirit. The eternal is spirit. Flesh is the transient thing. Your life is a vapor that appears for a brief time and vanishes away. The real life isn't this one. The real life is the life to come. The real life isn't the 70, 80, 90 years that we spend on this earth. The real life is the eternity that will come afterwards. Time will come to an end and eternity will begin. And that is where you need to have treasure. That's why Paul shows us the source of real encouragement in the other chapter that we read. After talking about Jesus coming and the trumpet sounding and the dead rising and us being caught up, he says, encourage each other with these words. The words that will stop us worrying about what is happening down here are these words. And the thought that this is temporal, this is brief, and what is coming is forever. This might, life might seem even like hell on earth. But don't worry, it won't be for long. Then we'll be leaving here and all the things which right now occupy our minds and fill us up so there's no room for the word of God and some of those stubborn worries that it doesn't matter how many times the pastor advises us, we come back with the same question. Those stubborn ones that just won't seem to go. It won't be for long. It won't be for long. Jesus is coming back. Eternity will begin. And every day we're a bit closer. <laughs> so I just want to have a quick look at 10 things that we don't need to worry about. And starting with something very simple. Simple. What's your name? Answer to yourself. Do you like your name? Because not everybody does. My older sister, she, when she was young, she didn't like her name. Now she's happier with it. But there's some weird names. You know, Archibald. Can you imagine? We, we know a lady in Spain who's called Emily Gilda. I guess you could think of some, uh, you know, with the international variety, we have some pretty, some pretty weird names. But if you don't like your name, don't worry. Because in heaven, you're going to have a new name. And actually, not just one, you're going to have two. Jesus said, I will write on the overcomer the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, and I will also write on them my new name. That's the first name you're going to have. You know, God is going to, Jesus is going to print on us our, our surname, you know, the name of my God, that's our family, our family name. I belong to God. You're no longer going to be the family name of whoever your, whatever your surname is right now. Your name would be God's family. That will be printed on you. And then your address, the New Jerusalem, that will be printed on you. We won't need a card. You know, we'll have surname, address, and your new name. And that will be the name that everybody else will call you in heaven. That's your first name, your new name. 
But then in Revelation 2, I will give each overcomer a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. God will also give you a secret name. You know, there's, there's an awful lot of us, aren't there? You know, even, even though there are more unbelievers than believers, there's still an awful lot of believers. And somehow, the love of God can seem a bit widely spread. But God wants us to realize that he loves each one as much as any mother loves her little baby. Well, in fact, more than that. And that is what God, how God loves you. And in heaven, he will communicate that love to you personally with a name which describes you to him. How he feels about you. And that name will be a secret between you and God forever. So don't worry about the name you've got now. You've got two new names coming. A name given to you by Jesus, your Christian name. And a name given to you by God, which nobody else will know except you. Second thing, where are you from? Do you like your country? You know, some things usually we like about our country and other things we don't like, but we defend our country, don't we? We feel a loyalty. But it's not good to get too patriotic, really, about our country. It says of Abraham, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And he and all of them died, lived by faith, and were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God and he has prepared a city for them. They have a different fatherland. And I want to tell you that I have too. A different fatherland. A different country. A, an enormous, uh, my country is an enormous city, which if you look into it, you will discover it's the size of Western Europe, including Germany. And it's built like a pyramid. It's as wide as it is long as it is high. And it will come down from heaven shining like a diamond that shines in the sun. But it won't be the sun. It will be the glory of God. Shining with 12 different colors of jewels in the foundations. And through streets of transparent gold. And it will hover in orbit like the space station. I don't know if you knew that. But the word says the nations will walk in her light. The light of this city will be like the new sun and the new moon. The nations will walk in her light. And that means as the world turns, day and night will be created by the city. There will be no night there, but on the earth, the city will be giving light to the earth. I don't know if there will be a sun and moon as well, but the glory of the earth will be the light from the holy city. A continent suspended in Spain and in orbit. It's not that strange. The moon is a, a satellite suspended in space and going around the earth. The space station, the satellites, they're all a lot closer. But that's what they are. And the holy city, I don't know how we're going to get up and down, but right now Elon Musk is taking people up and down to the space station, so it's not that difficult. Yeah? And Jacob, he saw a ladder, right, that was going up and down to heaven with angels walking up and down. Jesus just ascended, suspending gravity temporarily and, and just going upwards. So it can be done. And Elijah, a chariot of fire came and took him up. So I don't know how we get up and down, but that's, that's my country. 
That's my country. That's where I'm going to be living. That's my fatherland. Spain and England, they can't compare with that. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm a pilgrim. I'm an ambassador. In fact, I'm an alien. An extraterrestrial. And you know what E.T. said? He wanted to go home. <laughs> Number three, where do you live? Do you like your house? It may be, it just may be, there's somebody here with a, de a detached six-bedroom, three-bathroom place in the country with a Tesla and one or two more cars in the drive. It may be. Or maybe you're living in a room sharing a house with other people or even sharing a room. Or maybe you just rent a small place and you've got difficult neighbours in a rough area. I don't know what your house situation is. My mum and dad's last place was a bungalow in a quiet close in Joydon's Wood Estate. And to get there you pass some really classy places along Summerhouse Drive. And you know when we were driving to mum and dad's house we never tired of saying wow look at that place. <laughs> beautiful way out of our reach but you know if you don't like the place where you're living don't worry don't worry Jesus promised in my father's home there are many houses I'm going to prepare a place for you it'll be ready for when you arrive talking of the city it said it has foundations and its architect and builder is God well the houses too Jesus said, I'm preparing it. They're designed and prepared by Jesus. So whatever you have here, don't worry. A fantastic house is waiting for you and the neighbours, angels, cherubims and righteous men and women made perfect. You can't get better than that. What about your hometown? In Spain, for a lot of people, the hometown is very important. People say in the summer, you say, where are you going on holiday? I'm going to mi pueblo. Mi pueblo means my hometown. Some people just go there every year. Your hometown, it gives you a sense of identity. My hometown is Dartford. I don't know if you like your hometown. I have to say there's not a lot that I like about Dartford. But you know, if you don't, don't worry. Don't worry, we've already seen that the holy city, the New Jerusalem, is the size of a continent and shines with gold and with jewels. But what's it like on the inside? What will the area where you live be like? Revelation 22, the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing down the center of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. So in the New Jerusalem, the streets of your town are like enormous wide avenues, dual carriageways of gold on each side, paved with transparent gold, which we don't have here, but it exists in heaven. But then in the center of the avenue, between those two carriageways is a river, the river of life. And on the banks of the river, on each side, there's, there are rows of trees, lines of trees which grow on the grassy bank of the river. And each month the tree produces a new fruit. Well, what comes before the fruit? What, what do we see before the fruit comes? The blossom, the blossom, the flower. So every month you have the blossom of the fruit of next month and the fruit of this month. So that means every month the color of the avenues changes with the new flower and the smell, the fragrance changes with the new flower and with the smell of the fruit of the present month so you know that gives a whole new meaning to taking a stroll down the road of your town because 
you can walk along the golden street looking at the mansions on the side of the road or watching the chariots and the cherubims with their wheels within wheels going past or you can walk along the grassy verge under the trees and breathe in the fragrance and take a piece of fruit from the tree of life or you can sit in the shade on the bank of the river and take a drink of water of life that's my hometown folks that's my hometown that's where I belong nowhere in England or Spain can compare with that I don't know about you but if that's your home don't worry about where you live now for a few brief years because soon you'll be walking streets of gold what about possessions Maybe you're like the rich young ruler with a lot of possessions, many possessions, or maybe you don't have two hatenes to rub together, as we used to say. Well, don't worry. Don't worry. Spend your time on this earth serving Jesus with all your heart, and your house in the New Jerusalem will be filled with treasure. Everything you do for the Lord and for his kingdom is an investment in the bank of heaven. Because Jesus said, store up treasure in heaven. What will those treasures be like? Well, I don't know. But Jesus said they're a lot better than the treasures down here, which go rusty and the clothes which get moth-eaten. So the treasures in heaven, I don't know what they're like, but Jesus said they're better. And I rather think I can trust Jesus. So don't get to heaven with an empty bank account. Serve Jesus, keep paid up with your tithes and offerings and don't worry about the economy. Whatever happens down here, whatever you have or whatever you don't have. The word of God says I've never seen the righteous forsaken or having to beg his bread. Paul says we're just having clothes and food, let us be content. But in heaven, in heaven, it's an abundance. What about food? Are you a person who enjoys your food? Do you eat out frequently? Can you afford those expensive restaurants occasionally? You know, we once went to one, invited by one of uh, Rebecca's bosses in the past, before Agape. And I think it was called Eat, Drink and Love was the name of the restaurant. <laughs> and you know, they, they gave you the menu. It was like 12 different plates of all funny little things in the middle of the plate, which were delicacies. And, uh, you know, you had one after the other. And it, I, I don't know what the guy paid for it. It was, it was ridiculous. But to be honest, one good steak would have been much better for me. Do you... Eat well or do you struggle to get to the end of the month with a plate of food on the table? Because that's some people's reality. And what about your state of health? Can you eat anything you like? Or do you have to miss out on your favorite food because it doesn't go down well? Or because you have to watch your cholesterol or look out for your sugar level? Or because your gallbladder or your peptic ulcers make things difficult or just because if you don't watch your food you don't dare step on the bathroom scales whatever your situation don't worry when you arrive in heaven you're going to be guests at a wedding supper which will last for years there'll be two events in the seven years between the rapture and Christ's return to rule on the earth first we will all pass before the judgment seat of Christ where we will be rewarded for our service to the Lord or not as the case may be but afterwards even if we are saved by the skin of our teeth as Job put it we will all be among the blessed and the holy saints who are invited and called to the marriage supper of the Lamb you know even if that only lasts for one of the seven years it's going to be absolutely incredible what will we eat well, I have no idea, but if men and women have been able to invent incredible mouth-watering dishes, you can't even begin to imagine what the angels can do. So there you are, sat at the table. You know how it is sometimes when you're in a restaurant, 
waiter and they seem to look at everybody else except you. That won't happen. As soon as you put your hand up, an angel will be right there beside you. Yes, sir. Yes, madam. What can I get you? And when you want to take a break from the feast, you have a walk around the tables. You'll be greeting Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Daniel and Esther and Ruth. When you spot Shadrach, Meshach or Abednego, you'll be able to sit down next to them and ask for more details about what it was like in the burning fiery furnace. It's going to be a great time. So don't worry if you can't eat everything you like now. When you're in heaven, you'll have no problem. And in terms of the things that we like, what about your social status? Do you feel important? Do you feel important in this life or do you feel totally insignificant? Do you feel maybe that nobody notices you or looks at you twice? Some people feel that maybe it's part of their own state of mind, but some people feel that even in the church. They shouldn't, of course. But through life we can feel like we are just nobody. But don't worry. Don't worry if that's how you feel. Jesus Christ loved us, it says in Revelation 1.6, washed, our, our, washed our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to our God and we will reign on the earth. Have you seen our folk queue up to greet King Charles or William and Kate? Or have you seen, have you noticed, you remember the reverence the whole world had for our late queen? Or just the way folk go crazy like they have done this weekend just to be at a Taylor Swift concert? Important people. You know, my maths teacher, our maths teacher, he told us that Mick Jagger, when he was at our school, he was just another ordinary kid. He didn't stand out at all. And now... He's the most important person who's come from Dartford since Watt Tyler in the 14th century. That'll be the change that'll happen to you. From being relatively a nobody to being famous. In the millennium, you're going to be in charge of cities and your title will be Your Majesty. Your Majesty. Of course, there are also things in this life which nobody can like. It's impossible to like sickness. Maybe you live in a constant struggle with pain and suffering, which makes you severely discouraged. And it is horrible to have to live with constant sickness and infirmity. But even so, I would dare to say to you, don't worry. Because your destiny is to dwell forever in a place where there is no death or pain or tears. And when you look back, despite the suffering that you have now, you will consider it a light tribulation not worth comparing with the glory and the blessing and the happiness of that life. Trials and temptations, nobody can like those. Do you get sick and tired of the struggle against sin? The constant bombardment of evil and the pressures and the stress of leave, living surrounded by ungodly people. Be patient. Be faithful to death, Jesus said. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. And don't worry because in heaven there will be no sin and no sinners and no temptation and no devil. Sorrow and affliction. Tragedy. Maybe you've lived more than your fair share of tragedy. Or even persecution. Many of our brothers and sisters are living horrific circumstances every day of their lives just because they're following Jesus. I don't really know anything about that, but Jesus did. And he said, fear nothing from those who can only destroy the body. And those dear brothers and sisters, they will be rewarded a thousand times over for their faithfulness to Christ. So, however dark your situation, however sorrowful the tragedy you may have to live through, never lose sight of your eternal hope and encourage yourself 
with such words. Horatio Spafford was a 19th century American businessman who lost everything in a great fire in Chicago, all of his business. And two years later, his family were traveling on a ship to England and they suffered shipwreck. And his wife survived, but all four of their daughters were lost. As Soon as he could, he left America to join his wife, took another ship. And when he reached the point in the Atlantic where their ship had gone down, he wrote a hymn which has blessed and encouraged and strengthened folk who are in tragedy ever since. When peace like a river attends my way, or when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, my situation, you have taught me to know it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. The Christ has regarded my helpless condition, estate. And has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. Whatever's happening in my body, in my life, in my circumstances, my surroundings, it is well with my soul. If all is well with your soul this morning, let nothing overcome you. Nothing can overcome you. So don't worry and encourage yourself with these thoughts. Even if here on this earth you don't like your name, your country, your house, your hometown, your possessions, your food, or your social status, don't worry. All those things would be fantastic for the whole of eternity. And even if you are suffering through sickness or temptation or affliction, look up and breathe deep and keep your hand on the plow and keep serving Jesus because it won't be long soon we'll be leaving here it won't be long we'll be going home as Andre Crouch said count the years as months count the months as weeks count the weeks as days we'll be going home there's only one thing you do need to worry about you know the whole of this has been don't worry but there is one thing you do have to worry about and it's that you're not going to miss out on eternal life are you absolutely sure that you are part of that of this are you totally converted truly converted committed to Jesus you know that you belong to the Lord that you've been born again and that you're serving him wholeheartedly are your eyes focused on things above and not on things on the earth have you totally turned your back on sin? Remember, we have to remember the warnings of the apostles. Paul says, of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure or covetous person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. He says, sexual immorality and impurity, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, strife, heresy, envies, wantonness, drunkenness, orgies and such things. Those who take part in those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. No unclean thing will enter the holy city. The homosexuals, the spiritists, the fornicators, the murderers, the idolaters, and all liars will be outside. And remember also the warnings of the Lord Jesus. That then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who went out to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise and five were foolish. And those who were foolish took no oil with their lamps and their lamps went out. 
Is your light burning for Jesus and are you living full of the Holy Spirit? The oil of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is coming back soon. So be observant, he says in Luke, in Mark rather, watch and pray because you don't know when the time is and when your master is returning. Look out that when he returns, he doesn't find you sleeping. So again, as Paul says, wake up if you're spiritually asleep and rise from death and Christ will give you light. Prepare yourself for the life to come. Lay hold on eternal life. Get ready for the holy city. Don't worry about any of the inadequacies or sufferings of this life, but worry about missing out on the life to come. Live out your salvation with fear and trembling at the thought of taking a step back or falling away or growing cold or even lukewarm. So are you ready? Are you ready? Let's close our eyes a moment and think and pray. And if you know that right now you're not ready, then get ready. Get ready. Don't put it off. While I'm praying, as I'm going to in just a moment, you stand up in the presence of Jesus as a way of saying to him what you're saying in your heart, God, I'm going to put things right with you. What things? Everything. Everything. You can't say everything except. No, everything. You stand up and say that to the Lord Jesus if you know that you need to because things aren't right. I'm going to pray. And while I'm doing so, while everybody else is in prayer, you stand to your feet. Father, Thank you for the wonderful encouragement of the promise of the reality of eternity which is so much more real than the life we're living right now. Where everything will be so much more real than the shadows of the future that we're living with now. Thank you, Father, for the tremendous privilege of an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray for every person here with me this morning, for every single one of us, to make sure that we don't miss out on eternal life. And anybody who should be standing right now because you're giving them the opportunity to state, make a statement before you, touch their heart. Touch their heart. Lord, let the word of God pass over their heads and be forgotten in the rest of the day. But keep speaking to them until... They respond to you, give everything over to Jesus and start living for you with all their hearts. Father, thank you. Thank you for everything you give us in this life, for every answer to prayer, for the way, as, Peter, as Paul said, we can not worry about anything but with prayer and supplication give our requests to God and so many times in so many ways you answer us and you step in. Father, even in those things which don't change, give us encouragement this morning to put those worries on one side and focus on the words of encouragement. You're coming soon and our eternity is going to be glorious. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.